2023 is a year where we've witnessed events that truly affected the people of Israel and the nations around them in different ways. It was a year where we needed the help of God and His intervention in so many things and learned so many valuable lessons. In 2023, we also witnessed internal and external challenges that Israel has faced, including the terrible war of October 7th. The implications of all of this and how they are navigating the complexities of these challenges. Hi, and welcome to a very special episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg, a podcast of the Joshua Fund, a ministry dedicated to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund. In today's episode, we're going to examine some of the top episodes that stood out in 2023 and share some comments, thoughts, and what impacted most of our listeners. Here's today's episode. Are you ready? Okay, let's get going. One of the episodes that gathered a lot of listens and views in 2023 was Dr. Stephen Collins. This episode details the filming of Tal El Haman, which is the biblical Sodom based on scientific and other evidence. Listen to Dr. Stephen Collins. Joel, would you introduce our guest and uh, and welcome uh, Stephen to our podcast? Good to be here. Yeah, Stephen, it's so great to uh, to have you, uh, and I'm so grateful uh, having just gotten to spend some time with you uh, here in Jerusalem, uh, interviewing you, for, interviewing you for a two part series we'll be doing uh, uh, pretty soon uh, on TBN, my Rosenberg Report show. Look, I, I want to make sure everybody in our audience understands what Carl Muller just said in the intro, because you, you really have to hear this. This is the man who has discovered the biblical site of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, actually, that were wiped out in the book of Genesis, and yet most people in the world don't believe even existed. Many people think that, even many liberal theologians don't believe that Sodom and Gomorrah was a real thing. Maybe it was allegorical or metaphorical, but but Jesus spoke of Sodom and Gomorrah as a very as very real places. In fact, he used uh, he, he he used Sodom to talk about like if if this is how God judged people in the past, do you really think you're, he's not going to do this in the future? I'm, I'm paraphrasing, and, and and Dr. Collins will work us through all that. But but this is one of the biggest archaeological discoveries of our time, maybe of, of uh, ever. I mean, it certainly is up there with uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and some and the discoveries, which would be non-biblical, but of King Tut and other things. Why? Because this is a place that most people think is mythical. Hmm. Or Christians think, well, I mean, I guess it could have been a real thing, but I mean, I, you know, we have no evidence of it. There's no archaeological evidence. So, I, you know, maybe it's maybe it's not a real thing. Those were two real cities. And they have now been found. Wow. The mainstream media doesn't get it. They don't care. Why? Because if you accept the idea that Sodom and Gomorrah were real <laughs> and that God judged it and destroyed it, whoa, Nelly, ooga, ooga, dive, dive. Like yeah. <laughs> it, all the implications around that biblical story come to play. God is real, God has standards. If you break them, there is a consequence, and homosexuality is yeah. just one of many things that God is not good with. All of that goes against the modern grain. Dr. Stephen Collins, thank you for joining us. And uh, so let me just start off with that. But you are an actual trained archaeologist. You, you, you've you worked in the Middle East for a long time, and you've been working on this site. This is not like, oh, I discovered it uh, yesterday with a, a, a toothpick and a, and a toothbrush. Um, and I think I might have found something I want a headline. No, no, this is this is 20 years in the making. So talk to us about how you first thought maybe the the Sodom that a famous Amer American evangelical archaeologist thought, no, that's over here. And everybody thought that who cared about it at all or believed it was real. And you started to doubt that. I want you to just start with, to take us into the story, and then we'll unpack it piece by piece. Good. 
Thank you, Joel. Good to be with you. Um, almost everybody, uh, as you alluded to, almost all scholars, evangelical particularly, uh, put Sodom toward the south end of the Dead Sea. It was just, if you've ever been to the south end of the Dead Sea, which I have and you have many times, it looks like a place God would have destroyed. I mean, sort of, so people sort of built their own etiological legend around that, that, piece, that piece of ge uh, geography and because it's kind of ugly and dry and salty and, um, you know. Yeah, nothing like grows it, there. It, nothing swims yeah. there. Yeah, exactly. It seems, seems like it kind of fits the bill. So, um, and I didn't have a problem with that. And all my early career, uh, you know, it just, I didn't really look into it. I didn't. The problem that, that I, I ran into eventually was I read the text. I actually <laughs> got into Genesis 13, which is the very detailed ge ge geographical map that takes a person to Sodom. I mean, that's what it's there for. Mm -hmm. And um, once I read that, uh, it became very difficult to me um, to even think about going south because as I read through that so many times, and I, I delved into a major study of that passage and, and other passages, uh, Genesis 14 is part of that too, uh, everything about the text locates Sodom north and east of the Dead Sea. Hmm. And I came to find out later that all the uh, explorer scholars uh, of the 19th century who went into that region uh, with a Bible, looking for Bible sites, always put Sodom on the north end of the Dead Sea. And um, but fact, something changed. What was it, <laughs> but, what was it yeah, that changed yeah. everybody's thinking to lock in as, oh, well, that person knows? Yeah. Well, uh, Number one, uh, hardly anybody had ever given much of a look to the north end of the Dead Sea archaeologically. So nobody really knew what was there. W.F. Uh, Albright, who was the most uh, influential archaeological scholar of the 20, 20th century, uh, came along, and uh, you have to really understand the power of his scholarship. I mean, he could make or break anybody's career if he liked them or mm -hmm. didn't like them. That's how uh, much influence he had. Mm -hmm. And so Albright, uh, because he'd been Albright, right, he discovered yeah. big things, and he'd been right oh, about sure. so much. Yeah. Right? and that's I mean, he, where he, he got his reputation. He's known. He, he's known by everybody. He's the father of biblical archaeology. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, Albright comes along, and um, he decides that there aren't uh, any archaeological sites in the South Dead Sea region that could possibly associate with the date of Abraham. They're all hundreds and hundreds of years too early. So what Albright did was he decided, well, possibly they're underneath that South shallow basin of the Dead Sea. And maybe there was an earthquake at the time of the destruction of Sodom and maybe the land sank and the Dead Sea waters flowed in over them. And that was his theory. And that was picked up by his protege, G.E. Wright. And, uh, Pretty much the rest is history. Everybody went to the south into the Dead Sea. Now, there were a few people like um, Bryant Wood and some others who, who went over to Baba Dra, which is a site, an old early Bronze Age site down in that area. Problem with that one is it was destroyed around 2500 B.C., which is many, many centuries prior to the birth of Abraham. I don't care when mm -hmm. you date Abraham. It's uh, mm -hmm. way too early. So um, the, when I began to research it and looked at that, I said, no None of this is right. One crucial point to note is that science actually reinforces our biblical beliefs as Christians and shouldn't lead us away from it. This episode talks about the impact of this find globally and why God destroyed Sodom and how the world is walking on the precipice of a destruction right now as it happened in Sodom. Can you guess the next episode that tops our list of podcasts for 2023? It was War Insights from a Former Israeli Prime Minister, Episode 135. In this episode, Joel goes over some of the insights that former Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett shared with him on questions regarding Israel's current situation and the future. Listen as Joel points out a few things in this episode. He not only was the former Prime Minister, he also previously had been the Defense Minister for Israel. He served in a number of other cabinet positions, including the, the security cabinet. And as you say, he was not only a commando, but a, a major and therefore a commander in Israel's most elite special forces unit known as Sayeret Matkal. So wow. somebody with enormous amounts of experience, Naftali Bennett, not exactly a household world, a right. word in America. He, he only served as prime minister for one year, 
uh, we can get into that. But uh, it was a very interesting conversation. I'm sure it was. Now, Joel, his background uh, is fascinating. And like so many of Israel's leaders, they they have a military background. They have a uh, obviously a governmental background. And and that where does he see this current moment in Israel's history? And and what's uh, what does he see as the goals for the conflict and, and where we go from here? Sure. One other thing I should say about him, he uh, is a kippah, I mean, yarmulke wearing uh, Orthodox Jew, modern Orthodox, not ultra Orthodox, but it made him the first ever religious Israeli ever to serve as prime minister of Israel. That's wow. kind of interesting. 75 years, Israelis have tended not to elect uh, religious people. He happened to be part of a coalition that ousted Benjamin Netanyahu and built a new government uh, with Yair Lapid mm -hmm. um, and Benny Gantz and uh, Naftali Bennett, Bennett being, being asked by the others to serve as prime minister because Bennett used to be Netanyahu's chief of staff. And it was a, and both uh, Netanyahu and Bibi's older brother Yonatan Yoni Netanyahu were both in Sayyarat Matkal a number of years ahead of, of Bennett. So so Bennett in many ways is a protege hmm. of uh, we might say in even juggle terms a disciple mm -hmm. of Netanyahu. But they had a serious falling out a number of years ago, and um, after four rounds of elections, when it got to the fifth. Bennett, who has disagreements with Netanyahu, but hadn't been like the main person trying to drive Bibi out of office, decided that it, it was time for a change. So, uh, but that is the question I asked him. So uh, is what, what do you consider victory? And yeah. so former Prime Minister Bennett's uh, main view is that we absolutely have to uh, crush, eradicate, uh, vanquish, he used a number of uh, words, the Hamas terror regime in the Gaza Strip. He said, there's really no way out. We, we hear all these calls right now, including from the United Nations, demanding or calling for a ceasefire. But he, right. his basic point was, if, it's, if, you, if you call for a ceasefire right now, you're rewarding Nazis. You're rewarding yeah. ISIS. You know, nobody called for a ceasefire after, you know, Germany started bombing London right. and, you know, invading and taking over all of France and slaughtering millions of Jews. And so he said, you know, a ceasefire is not a, a helpful concept right now. It really is helping the enemy. But he said, we have to win, obviously, and we will. He said he's, he has no doubt. He, he knows the military. He knows the all the variables. And he said, there's no doubt we're going to win and win decisively in Gaza. Mm. But then I pressed him because I said, okay, well, I just spent... Uh, you know, a number of days up in the north, including with a TBN film crew, filming all the, you know, attacks that are coming from Hezbollah in <laughs> Lebanon against Israeli civilian sites, military sites, interviewing people, experts all along that border. He said, can we consider it a victory if we only win in the south? Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I don't That's want to question. share all the things that he said, because I also pressed him on Iran. And he said, I, I want to be careful not to advise the Israeli government. I'm not obviously in the spot that I was, but let me say that when I was the prime minister, we had a plan to do both of those things, to neutralize the Iran nuclear um, weapons threat and vanquish uh, the Hezbollah threat, whether they, you know, the current government decides to activate those plans. He says, you know, I, I, I can't, obviously I can't tell you, but right. not because he doesn't, I think because he doesn't know, but I would say reading between the lines, uh, my my uh, my impression was that he does believe that that he does believe that Israel will still be in mortal danger. Hmm. But he, you know, in, I also got the sense from him that you know he's not itching to go you know open up new fronts. But he said we're already being attacked right. by. We're, on, we're being attacked on five different fronts, Carl. Right now, we're being attacked by Hamas in Gaza. Mm. We're being attacked by Hezbollah in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Three, we're being attacked by Houthi yeah. terrorists in Yemen. Today, they just uh, fired another salvo of missiles. The first time that I'm aware of that Israel ever fired its aero missile defense system taking out one of those missiles that was coming into our southern city of Eilat. Huh. And so 
that's the third. Uh, well, yeah, you're right. So Gaza with Hamas, Lebanon with Hezbollah, Houthis from Yemen, but there's two others. Iranian forces in Syria mm-hmm. are attacking into the Golan Heights and in, in, in the galley. And on top of that, we have terrorist attacks inside the what people call the West Bank, what Israelis call, based on the Bible, Judea and Samaria. Wow. So that's a five-front war. Yeah. And that's uh, that's pretty dangerous. So he thinks this is going to go on quite some time. He doesn't think there's going to be a quick victory, but I guess I would say my sense of it was that he was saying, let's get the Gaza part done, and then we can focus on other sections. When a country like Israel is at war, a ceasefire may not work for every situation, but decisive action. We must keep interceding for Israel and its leadership so that the nation will turn to God and believe in Jesus. Our verse of the day today is found in Psalm 136, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercies endure forever. And our prayer requests today are, pray that as the year ends, Israelis, those in the Middle East, and other saints worldwide will be encouraged, no matter what the circumstances they face, to hold on to their faith in the Lord Jesus. And second, pray that the Lord blesses the Joshua Fund so that we may bless all those that we serve in the land. All the plans that have been made and all of the work that has been done this year to significantly impact the people of Israel and her neighbors in the places we serve in the epicenter. Let's see what's next on our top podcast list. It's Psalm 83 and the war in Gaza, in episode 134. It addresses a pressing question that many have asked us here at the Joshua Fund. If the Gaza war is part of the end times prophecy, this episode was very popular with listeners as Joel touched on the significance of the conflict and its potential ties to the war of Gog and Magog. Here are some highlights from that address. I, I think we have to be cautious not to jump to a conclusion that this is Gog and Magog. Okay, What we're seeing right now sure. is not written about in, in Ezekiel 38 and 39. We touched on this in, in the previous podcast. Could this set into motion Gog and Magog very specifically? Could it literally be it or could it be a precursor of it? And the answer to both of those is yes, but... Too early to say. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I think we'll get into that in a little bit more. But I just want to front load that there's no way you could definitively say, or even sort of guesstimate that this is Gog and Magog at the moment. The data doesn't fit. The, the puzzle pieces don't seem to fit what we know. But of course, the Bible doesn't give us all the every. De- it doesn't give us every detail. Mm-hmm. It gives us the details we need to know. And so some of these things could be precursors, and it could set into motion. So we'll get to that in a moment. There's another prophecy we should unpack a little bit, and that's Psalm 83. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people are wondering, is is this that war? But that presupposes that Psalm 83 is a prophecy mm. and that Psalm 83 describes a specific eschatological war. I don't think that it does. Uh, I'll get a lot of pushback from, from, from some quarters on that. <laughs> but I think Psalm 83 is uniquely and highly important to understand in this moment, and we'll we'll unpack that in a moment as well. Mm-hmm. And then the question of Gaza generally. That there's, tw- as you say, there's 20 mentions of Gaza in the Bible. Most of those they start in Genesis, yeah, uh, and they end in the Book of Acts. And 19 of the 20 are horrible for Gaza. <laughs> they describe Gaza being controlled by the most wicked and evil enemies of Israel, the Canaanites originally, mm-hmm. certainly the Amalekites. And the Philistines, Philistines, to name just three of the worst bad actors in the Bible. And th- this was like a base camp for all three empires or mini wow. empires. So there's a lot of talk of judgment of Gaza, its leaders and its people throughout the Old Testament, including specific prophets being sent to warn judgment is coming. Fire is coming upon Gaza wow. and uh, its walls will be destroyed and, and, you know, blown to smithereens and so forth. So does that have resonance to what's happening now? Well, we should talk about that. And, but I'll just say, I'll also front load one more piece. 
And that is there's one positive mention of Gaza in the Bible, and that's in Acts 16. And we'll look at somebody coming dramatically to faith in Jesus on the road from Jerusalem, where I am, into yeah. Yeah. Gaza. That's an important story, and it's part of God's heart for people in and near Gaza. So those, that's my way of describing, sort of saying up front <laughs> kind of where we're going, the roadmap, because I think it could get complicated. And also, I think I just want people to know, okay, I'll listen to this whole podcast because I'm interested in any or all of those pieces. Yeah. Well, I think, it, I think it's great. And it is so fascinating because, I mean, if you look at, if you look at where Gaza is geographically, it's right at the corner, if you will, between Egypt and Israel. It's this the curve of the Mediterranean there. And it, it's a geographically, it couldn't be more favorable from a standpoint of, you know, being a connecting point between, you know, in the ancient times, great empires, but uh, maybe talk a little bit about elements of Gaza's history that haven't been so, so wonderful as their geography might allow them to be. Yeah. <laughs> what are some of the things we know about Ga Gaza from the Bible and from history? Right. Well, Genesis chapter 10, God describes Gaza as part of the, the land that was occupied by the Canaanites. This was the original people that were so evil, yeah. so wicked, that God in his sovereign decision-making capacity said, this is not a redeemable people. Hmm. That doesn't happen too often in the Bible. <laughs> uh, but it happened in this case so badly that God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take your, the Canaanites' land, I'm going to give it to the nation of Israel. That's yeah. pretty dramatic. Yeah. And that point is still the core of the Arab Israeli, the certainly the Palestinian Israeli conflict to this day. Mm -hmm. The Palestinians say, This is our land and you took it. You say God gave it to you, but you took it. And this is the same argument that has gone back from the original mentions of the Bible in Genesis chapter 10. So we're talking early. Okay, so that's just one example. We'll go through others. The book of Judges, chapter 1, God uh, directs the armies of the Israelites, specifically the armies of Judah, mm -hmm. to conquer Gaza. And they did. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can, if you're, if you're not a believer, you could say, well, that's just terrible. Well, you need to take that up with God. So in the midst of this conflict, how do we pray for those in Gaza? And how do we reach out to them? As Christians, it's always important to understand the prophetic picture of where we are right now and pray for peace and healing in Gaza. Did you guess any one of these correctly yet? Okay, let's look at the next episode on our list of top podcasts for 2023. In the episode, Israel War, the Early Stages of Bible Prophecy, episode 133, we come to understand what's going on in Israel's northern border and the potential threats this poses. So let's listen to a clip from this episode. The, the northern border is so volatile, and I don't know how many more days it'll take before this gets uploaded. So I just want to put the context in, mm -hmm. because Hezbollah is the uh, terrorist organization funded, armed, trained, and directed by Iran. And Hezbollah controls modern day Lebanon. In fact, it, for all intents and purposes, Carl, as you know, there is no sovereign state of Lebanon anymore. Effectively, yeah. Lebanon is a province of the Iranian regime. And while there is a, a quasi, I, I don't want to call it a public government, there's, there's actually a, a weak uh, government in Beirut, uh, it, but it doesn't really have con control of the country. And m many Lebanese hate Hezbollah and are horrified by, by being in a slave state essentially to it. Nevertheless, Hezbollah has been like, begun attacking Israeli military and civilian positions all along the Lebanon-Israeli border for more than a week now. Not immediately when Hamas uh, in Gaza, launched its horrific, barbaric, savage October 7th invasion, uh, mm -hmm. murdering more than 1,300 Israelis just on that day alone. And now we're you know, well over 1,400 uh, over the last uh, 18 days or so. But almost immediately, maybe within you know four or five days, Hezbollah started attacking. A little bit here, a little bit there. It seemed like they were probing, didn't want to be left out of mm -hmm. the battle. But now it's it's becoming much, much more. So 
I wanted to go up and do some reporting on that Lebanon uh, Israeli border uh, for all Israel news. I also took a film right. crew with me from TBN for the Rosenberg report. Yeah, there was well, artillery, mortars all day. We were hearing automatic gunfire. I mean, there was a missile from Hezbollah in Lebanon at Israel's largest city on that northern tier. It's a, it's not that big, but it's a city called Kiryat Shmona, mm -hmm. and that's about 20,000 Israelis. But 63 or 64 Israeli communities all along that border now, including hmm. Kiryat Shmona, have now been ordered to evacuate. Most Israelis are wow. out of those forward areas now and Israeli tanks and troops are moving in and this thing could blow I mean sky high much worse than what's going on with Hamas at any moment wow well Joel I mean we got a chance to some of us got a chance to watch that video you did uh, from the northern border and it is uh, it's chilling to realize another front maybe opened up besides the the front in Gaza Maybe you could help our listeners. What are the differences between Hamas and Hezbollah? I mean, Israel's facing them both right now. Yeah, uh, there's some significant differences. First of all, Hezbollah is vastly uh, larger and much more powerful. So, for example, we now have roughly 7,500 rockets fired from Gaza by Hamas at Israeli civilians. Okay, about 7,500. That's we're approaching twice as many in the last 18, 20 days than for the entire war that when we moved here uh, in August of 2014, Hamas had fired about 4,300. So we're, we're almost double that. Whereas uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon has the estimates are between 150,000 and 200,000 missiles. There's a distinction, wow. right? Missiles are much more powerful, but much bigger, much more firepower. And many, but not all, of Hezbollah missiles, all produced in Iran, have precision guidance. So if they want to fire wow. at a hospital, they can fire at a hospital. If they want to fire at a power station or an oil storage facility or an electrical plant or mm. the Knesset or, you know, the American embassy or wherever, they can do it. Now, Israel does have uh, layered, multi-tiered missile defense systems, the Patriot and then the Aero anti-missile system, and there are three levels of that, Aero 1, Aero 2, Aero 3, for depending on the, the, the arc of that missile. We also have something called David Sling. We now have something called the uh, Iron Laser or the Laser Dome, which hasn't been tested in battle yet, but it has been tested as, so the question is, do you have to fire a missile or can you just fire a laser at something? Yeah. And then, of course, there's Iron Dome also more for the uh, shorter range rockets. So in terms of magnitude, it's generally estimated that Hamas has about 20,000 total. So they're, they're approaching about 40, 45% of their, uh, their known capacity. Okay. And by the way, in, the, in recent days, the number of rocket attacks have actually started to drop. And hmm. the number of failures of Hamas rockets, meaning they, they go up, but they go right down yeah. on top of Palestinians in Gaza, that's been increasing to about one in yeah. five. Hamas rockets now, but Hezbollah is much more powerful. That's so. That's the first thing: the size, the magnitude. But the second thing, and this is important for our inside the epicenter listeners and viewers to understand: Hamas is actually a Sunni radical Islamist terror organization. It's specifically an offshoot or a subsidiary of the original Sunni Islamist radical terror organization out of Egypt that started in the early 1920s, uh, known as the Muslim Brotherhood. Sure which is illegal, an organization that's a terrorist organization that's illegal in Egypt, in Jordan, in Saudi Arabia, in Bahrain, in the United Arab Emirates and throughout the region. So, but Hezbollah is not Sunni. It's Shia mm. uh, Islamist. And it's, I wouldn't call it radical Islamist. I would call it apocalyptic Islamist. What do I mean by mm. that? I mean, it's run by a man named Hassan, Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah, who has the same apocalyptic end times genocidal theology and eschatology as Iran's grand ayatollah, the supreme leader, Ali Khamenei. So both organizations are genocidal. No question. They want to eradicate every Jew, every Christian, and every Muslim that doesn't agree with them in what yeah. they call, you know, occupied Palestine. And we would know as biblical Israel. 
but Hezbollah is it's driven by a, an apocalyptic eschatology that really mm-hmm. it, it drives their belief that this is this is the end of days, and um, if they wipe out all the Jews and Christians here, uh, they will help usher in the literal judgment day and the arrival of the of the Mahdi or the twelfth Imam. This is known as their Islamic Messiah, and Jesus is supposed to come with the Mahdi at the end of days, and Jesus is the deputy. He's not the king of kings. He's not the Lord of lords. He's the deputy that forces everybody in the world to submit to this brand of genocidal apocalyptic Islamism, or Jesus kills us all. So it's important to understand yeah. this, is, this is a pathology. It's a, you know, it's a, yeah. it's a sick, and, and there's no way to deter them. And this is what terrifies Israelis right now. Clearly, Iran funds, arms, and controls Hezbollah in Lebanon. So Israel must prepare for a potential Hezbollah invasion. Ignoring Hezbollah and leaving Iranian leadership unchecked, no doubt will result in worse attacks. We must help those suffering in uncertain times and pray for God's mercy in these dark hours. The special update, Israel at War, number 127, was aired at a time of great uncertainty in Israel, and attacks were literally ongoing when we recorded it. The implications of the conflict between Israel and Iran and the special spiritual aspects of this situation and the importance of supporting our brothers and sisters in Israel were so highlighted in this episode. Let's listen to a clip from this podcast. God commands us to pray for peace because that is not the natural state of of order here. Uh, Because God loves Israel, Satan hates Israel. Because God chose the Jewish people to bless us, Satan chose us to curse us. Hmm. Because God said Jerusalem, will, Jerusalem will be the city of peace, the Satan said, I'm going to, you know, make it a city of bloodshed. Uh, because God said, I'm going to give you this land to the Jewish people. Yeah, yes, to love their neighbors, but to, but to give us this land. Satan said, I'm going to take it away. And, and God said, I'm going to make the temple mount holy to my name. And Satan said, fine, I will desecrate it. And this is this is where we are. So, yes, we've got to pray for peace, geopolitical peace. We also have to peace, pray for the peace that passes all understanding, okay? Because Israelis are scared, and I can't remember the last time I said that. I'm not sure if I've ever said it. Israelis are very resilient. We have a lot of experience with war over 75 years. This is not the same. And I'll explain all that in a moment. Israelis are scared. They're hurting we're grieving. We don't know what the future holds. And the vast majority of Israelis don't know who holds the future. So this is a problem, yeah. right? Right at a moment of tremendous pain and attack uh, that, I, again, I was in Washington, D.C. for 9-11. Mm-hmm. I wasn't around, of course, for Pearl Harbor. But I'm using those two very examples very specifically because this is a sneak attack unlike almost any other time in Israel's history right. because it's a terrorist attack. So I just want to give that framework and we can talk about specifics in a moment, but yeah. uh, you got to pray without ceasing. And uh, yeah, so let me stop there for a moment. Yeah. Well, I think Joel, you know, uh, it was it, from my perspective, you know, I'm, I was actually on a plane over here to the UK to meet with our UK team at the Joshua fund for, uh, you know, some strategy meetings when got the WhatsApp from you to, Hey, this is happening. Please pray. That was the first, the first inkling that something bigger than normal was going on. And, uh, and of course we've seen now news reports over the last 36 hours or so of, of the way this is unfolding. You know, we will talk about what this might have in, in terms of larger implications, but for right now in this part of the conversation, what's really happening in Israel right now? I mean, there are lots of things that are going on, but you're there. Tell us a little bit of what you've heard and what you've seen uh, taking place, even as even as we're you know still in the midst of uh, the fog of war on this uh, on this day. Let me start with where we are right this moment, um, Sunday evening, October 8th. Okay, this all started on October 7th. Carl, as I was just mentioning to you just before we actually started recording, uh, the breaking news here in Israel is that the Israeli government has officially confirmed all of our worst fears. 
that more than 100 Israeli citizens have been captured, abducted by Hamas terrorists hmm. and, and taken inside Gaza. Uh, I, uh, there's been a lot of video of, of, of these moments of people being pulled out of cars, uh, uh, wounded people being put on you know, uh, flatbed trucks or whatever and driven back. There's one image that just is so searing and haunting for me, and, and maybe it may be the quintessential image for most Israelis at this point, which is of a young woman, probably in her maybe young 20s. Her name is Noah, N-O-A. She's captured by two Hamas terrorists. She's put on a motorcycle. She's screaming. Uh, she's in tears. She's screaming to her friends as she's taken away into Gaza. I'm sure thinking that she'll never see the light of day again. And now there's video of her father being interviewed, having had to watch that video to confirm it was his daughter. And he is weeping and, and almost inconsolable. So the emotional wreckage on the Israeli people right now, just from this number of 100 Israelis captured and abducted and taken into Gaza, but that alone will be horrible enough. But I'll add two other numbers just for the moment. Uh, more than 650 Israelis are now confirmed dead, yeah. 650 in the last 36 hours. Now that's bad enough, at, you know, no matter where you're from, but you know, we've got to keep in some perspective into context. The United States is 330 million people and we're 10 million in, in Israel. So, so it's a magnitude of, you guys are 33 times larger in terms of population than us. So if you look at 650 people dead, and you put it in an American context, you know, multiplying times 33, just have a sense. That would be like you all in America waking up and hearing that 21,450 Americans had died in a single 36 hour period. Yeah. Like, wow. That has never happened. That's more than 9 11, which was 3,000. That's more than, you know, Pearl Harbor. That's like, that is just in, almost inconceivable for Americans. And this is why this is so bad. And then on top of that, there are another 2,000 Israelis who've been severely wounded. That's 60, that's like 66,000 Americans wounded. Like wow. that's war. That's, you know, it's Vietnam war. era casualties, yeah. not your data. Yeah. So that just should get, you know, those numbers are, are individual people, but they, they yeah. give you a sense of just how bad this is. And we're totally blindsided by, a combined sea air land attack where terrorists were paragliding in, they were coming in by motorized rafts and they were blowing up the security fence between Israel and Gaza and then just driving and storming across the border and killing or capturing everybody they saw. Yeah. Oh, it, uh, the video has been chilling and, you know, certainly brings it brings to mind other conflicts in the Middle East, but nothing at this scale in Israel. This podcast episode was recorded at a time when the people of Israel were hurt, scared, and grieving, and faced essentially the Israeli version of 9-11. The episode sheds light on the realities faced by the Israeli people and emphasizes the need for our prayers, support, and understanding. Finally, Here's the last episode of our top list of 2023 episodes. It was called, What's It Like Living in a Missile Zone? Episode 126 by Dr. Leah Malul, who shares her firsthand experience living in a missile zone. Here's a clip from that episode. Because my family, my husband, my four children, which two of them are currently serving the IDF, are living in the city of Ashkelon, the city of the biblical hero Samson, where for the past eight years, we have been struggling to stay alive under a barrage of vicious rocket attack. For the past eight years, a civilian population of roughly 500,000 men, women, and children have been attacked non-stop and felt the terror of over 8,000 rockets. I cannot believe that there is any other nation in the world that would agree to live not for eight years, 
not for eight months and not even for eight days under this kind of rocket attack. For eight years, the government and the people of Israel were very, very patient and did not react to the unprovoked terror attack against them. However, when Joel was standing there in the middle of the war in January 2009, he was very brave. After those eight years, maybe too late, Israel decided that enough is enough. And finally, took action to defend her land, herself, and its people. It is very sad that during those eight years of suffering and hardship, the international community and the United Nations did not raise their voice. They were silent, and now, with no shame, they demoralize us by telling us that our reaction is not proportional. <laughs> the only true friend that supported Israel and justified its action for self-defense was the United States of America. <laughs> the real and only true friend of Israel. Indeed, here and now, I feel that I'm among real friends, among brothers, among family, among the people that will go out and tell the true story. Now I want to share with you the story of our life during those eight years. I want to tell you about our terrified children who will for the rest of their life carry the scars of living in a war zone. I want to tell you about our women that feel for themselves, their husbands, their families. I want to tell you about our fighting men who while fighting the vicious enemy feel for their families more than themselves. And I know I've got one of them, two of them in the army. You have to imagine eight years in which thousands upon thousands of adults and children are suffering from post-trauma stress disorder, which 20% of them are turning to be chronically ill. And this has become a very and it's an unbearable burden on the society. A whole generation who will struggle to live a normal life and grow up to have a promising future. A whole generation that like me, when I'm walking in the streets of San Diego and I hear the sirens of the police cars and ambulance, I know that I have 15 seconds to run for cover because that's what we have from the minute the siren starts coming. 50 seconds that you don't know who to schlep with you first, do your elderly, your children, your pets, yourself. But then after a few seconds, I realize I'm in San Diego. <laughs> Imagine day after day, year after year, a weary expectation and exhaustion takes over. Slowly, the souls become exhausted from seeing the slaughter and the horror that is calmly surrounding it, as though something of this nature could become commonplace and now has become commonplace. Normal. As Anna then said, it became the banality of the evil. We must not reach that point. Reaching this point means surrender to the enemy. Leah takes us on a journey through the struggles, hardships, and resilience of the Israeli people who bravely live under the threat of enemy attacks. 
Israelis need your prayers and support as they constantly live under the threat of the dangers also inherent in the epicenter from an enemy whose target is to destroy the Jewish state and our common values. Thanks for listening to this episode. I'm sure you've had a great time reviewing our list of great and popular episodes for 2023. Remember to keep praying for Israel, its neighbors, and the Joshua Fund as we enter a new year. And especially as you consider your year-end gifts, please consider giving to the Joshua Fund. It's a ministry dedicated to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus, and we need your support. And if you found this podcast really valuable, please get in touch with us. Let us know who you are. Do you want to talk about something else on the show? Do you have a question that you want Joel to answer? Go to joshuafund.com and click on Contact Us. Your feedback is incredibly valuable as we develop this podcast. And as always, you can check out our show notes for anything you heard on the podcast you'd like more information on. So on behalf of Joel Rosenberg and the entire Joshua Fund ministry team, I'm Carl Muller. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg. I'm Joel Rosenberg. On your left, you'll find some videos we've chosen specifically for you. We look forward to partnering with you to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus.